Consciousness being an immaterial form of energy is hardly a new idea. Over 2,000 years ago, the Greek philosopher Plato proposed the existence of non-physical essence to all things, and that immortal souls bestowed human consciousness. Though this concept of mind-body dualism is still widely held by religious and spiritual seekers, most contemporary scientists view that consciousness is generated by the brain and its network of billions of nerves. Dr. Carl John Friston, a theoretical neuroscientist and authority on brain imaging, joins me to discuss the theory of consciousness, psychedelics, and the perception of reality while using the compound, future technologies like the Neuralink and how consciousness will be perceived then, along with how neurodiversity could change our workforce in the years to come. Join us as we get rebelliously curious. Dr. Carl John Friston, thank you for joining me on Rebelliously Curious today. So obviously the conversation of consciousness is a really, really big topic. You know, 2000 years ago, we have Plato that mainly talked about the mind body dualism. So before we go down multiple roads of consciousness, can you explain to me what, what consciousness is um, in, in your words? In my words, and they are just my words. Um, so from my perspective, consciousness is sentience. It's making sense of the world. Um, mathematically, that corresponds to inference or abductive reasoning. So the, the particular inference that I'm talking about here is inferring what caused my sensations. And I'm talking about sensations from everywhere, from our eyes and ears, but also uh, from our muscles, from our um, gut, our interceptive uh, signals. So how do we make sense of all this data? Inference then is a mathematical expression of sense making um, in the sense that you are inferring the causes. So if I were to infer that this object, say a cat, was responsible for this particular pattern of semantic uh, um, sensory um, input, somatosensory input and visual input, that would be an act of inference. On that view, um, consciousness then becomes a process and a process of, of, of inference. Um, that's technically quite an interesting way to conceive of consciousness because um, it begs two questions. Uh, first of all, how does inference work in the brain and how can it be understood in terms of beliefs mm -hmm. you know not necessarily personal beliefs they could be subpersonal but states of mind that have a content namely the thing that you have inferred and the other question it begs is how is that biologically physically implemented in a brain you know what are the mechanics and I'm going to talk about Bayesian mechanics here, because if you talk about inference, you are implicitly talking about probabilistic inference. You can always write that down as, as um, in terms of Bayesian. Also, what are the substrates, the physical substrates, the chemical substrates of that Bayesian mechanics, sometimes called Bayesian belief updating? So for me, consciousness is a process of inference. Um, it is the process of updating one's belief in making sense of our sensorium. When you say updating one's belief, can you can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Um, because how do you, how do you update one's belief over time? You know, through consciousness or the understanding right. of it. Uh, so there are many different timescales at which you can sort of write down or study or understand uh, this process. So. Um, very, very fast inference would be of the sort that you're using now when looking at me. Um, you are inferring that I am me, uh, Dr. Carl John Friston. I am, right. I am producing various visual signals and auditory signals. Um, you have to also infer the consequences of your actions and you are acting. You are um, making saccadic eye movements every 250 milliseconds 
all of this very fast, very delicate um, engagement with the sensorium depends upon you inferring and updating your beliefs about what I am saying, where I am positioned, how that particular head movement produces that particular um, pattern of um, visual impressions. So that kind of inference, very, very fast inference, that fast belief updating would be almost subpersonal. You're not necessarily conscious of it, but it's, it's going on somewhere in your brain because your brain is telling your eyes where to move and it's making sense of the visual and, and the auditory signals. So technically, um, you are what an engineer would call a Kalman filter, open brackets with bells on in the sense you can control the data that you're filtering um, by resampling, visually palpating your, uh, your visual world. So belief updating is just the mathematical or the formal way of saying the state, the physical state of your brain is accumulating information, sensory evidence, in order to make sense and make inferences about the causes, the, the states of the world, states of affairs out there that you can't directly access. So often these are called sort of hidden or latent states. You can't, you're not directly in touch with those states of the world. So the presence of a cat or me talking about Bayesian inference. You, um, these states are things that you infer, infer that there are explanations that your brain brings to the table that are the best explanation for this stream of sensory input. And that um, process, um, I repeat, is sort of a process of Bayesian belief updating, mediated physically by um, very fast message passing, neural activity, fluctuations in, uh, in electrochemical potentials, firing of nerve cells as one nerve cell talk, talks to another nerve cell. So that's what I mean by belief updating, but of course, there are many other, if you like, scales, temporal scales and physical scales where this kind of process has to occur. And I'm talking here right through to evolutionary time scales. You know, yeah. In a sense, natural selection can be thought of as Bayesian model selection um, over millennia. So basically, um, testing hypotheses, making inferences so that you can regard me and you as the product of the environment updating its beliefs, physically encoded in my phenotype and your phenotype, about what is the best denizen of a particular environment or eco niche. Um, there are lots of intermediate scales from um, fluctuations in our attention, and that's going to be relevant later, I think, when we, when we talk about psychedelics. Um, the, the, you know, changes where we're inferring not the content of what's going on, but the predictability of what's going on, where the newsworthy information lies, whether I should attend to this sensory stream or that sensory stream. And then at a time scale of seconds to minutes, there's going to be changes in the wiring and the connectivity, the, um, the coordination, the pattern of message passing determined or dictated by connection strengths between uh, different neurons. At a longer time period of say um, weeks and months, we'll have neuroplasticity where we're slowly accumulating evidence and building models of the world, learning what happens if I do that, or learning to drive a car, learning how to be this kind of person or that kind of person. So this kind of um, belief updating pertains to the structures of our connectivity, the connectome in our brain that is meant to supply a good model and be able to generate the same kinds of signals that we actually have to deal with. Um, and those timescales can be over many years, say in neurodevelopment, for example, or indeed the amount of time it does take you to, to, to learn to, to drive a car. So technically belief updating or Bayesian belief updating is, um, is really um, a mechanism of a statistical sort that you can see unfold in many different guises and at many different timescales with many different kinds of biology in our heads. Crucially, all of these different timescales contextualize the others. So, you know, how you palpate the world visually, how you make sense of my, um, uh, my auditory um, stimulation 
that depends upon what you have learned and what you are attending to. So, you know, making those fast inferences, doing that fast belief update of a neural activity is situated within and contextualized by the slow learning about this is how the world, the way the world works, and this is what I should be attending to at this moment or that moment. Wow. And I've never even, I've never even thought about belief updating before. I've never even thought that that would be something that, you know, in general, in, in attached to consciousness, you know, like we're always updating our belief systems, but in a conscious form. And then how do we uh, evaluate that internally? There was a study done by um, Oxford University Press Journal. Uh, it was a neuro, sorry, the Oxford University Press Journal of Neuroscience Consciousness. Uh, and it was done by Dr. John Joe McFadden. And he says that they've solved the age old question of consciousness. Um, and what he's saying is consciousness is the experience of nerves plugging into the brain's self-generated electromagnetic field to drive what we call free will or, or involuntary actions. So do you subscribe to that yourself, that something that would be, you know, connected into our plug into our brain is that's what's generating free will. This is nothing to do with anything else that's, you know, maybe spiritual based um, or religious based in any context, but it really is just a mechanism of the brain. Hmm. That, that, that's a challenging question. Um, I certainly think that there has to be a brain mechanism underwriting that kind of um, sentience. Um, but of course, that's a very special kind of, of consciousness you're talking about. You know, using words like free will and volition brings mm -hmm. all sorts of, of, of um, not baggage, but certainly kinds of consciousness, kinds of sentient behavior to the table, uh, which I haven't, you know, sort of subsumed in that list of different kinds of belief updating. So the, first of all, as you properly mentioned, in folk psychology or in, um, in um, a lay conversation, belief updating would be naturally assumed to be propositional beliefs, narrative beliefs, beliefs that I could articulate and discuss and I am aware of, um, which itself um, presupposes that you have the kind of brain that can actually have those kinds of um, propositional beliefs that you hold, which itself implies that you have um, a belief that you are a thing. Um, and furthermore, if you talk about free will and volition and you're aware of free will and volition, you're also aware of yourself as a thing that is an agent that has volition. So all of these are sort of putting layer upon layer upon layer of um, sophistication into the kind of consciousness that, that, you know, that, 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 that uh, Dr. McFadden was, uh, was probably talking about. I certainly think that, you know, that volition and free will um, are going to be emergent properties or certainly um, go hand in hand with electrochemical discharges in the brain. There has to be a message passing, a physical message passing to do belief updating. And if the kind of beliefs that we're talking about are beliefs about what I'm going to do next, and even more, the puzzlement, how is it that I can choose how to do next, which is a big question of free will, just these hypotheses themselves are beliefs. So you must have done some belief updating, which means you must have changed your physical state of the brain. So I think he's absolutely, or that team is absolutely right to say that there is um, an underwriting, a physical underwriting of the kind of belief updating that would be construed as um, volitional or um, experienced as expressing free will. Um, so I've slightly eluded the question because in my world, the hypothesis that I have free will is just another belief. It's just a hypothesis, a fantasy, an abductive product, a product of abductive inference right. that best explains the way that my world works and, and the, um, um, the patterns of sensory impressions that I, that I am compelled to explain. I can imagine lots of very functional biotic systems, you know, so like a virus or um, a worm, um, that don't necessarily have to have this hypothesis to function perfectly, but things like you and me certainly do have this notion that, oh, I'm a person, 
and furthermore, I'm in person in charge of what I can do. But that itself, if that is a product of belief updating, then yes, it will be underwritten by um, neuronal activity and message passing in the brain. Right. And if we're updating our hardware in our brain, you know, in the future, and we look at things like the Neuralink, you know, love the Neuralink and what they're doing and, and what Elon Musk is doing in that company. When we're updating that <laughs> and we're putting something into our body, and then later on, we have this concept of uploading memories that might happen, you know, it could be a hundred years from now, it could be 50 years from now, it's not anytime soon. But what does that mean to consciousness in the future then? Like, what is that evolution? Because if we're seeing that it's both, you know, our belief system that we have, and then along with then a hardware that there, it's a combination, maybe potentially of both, then what happens then when you updated the hardware personally within your body, but then you've also then taken it and put it somewhere else in a cloud, does the concept of consciousness still exist? And does it still alive in that space? Or has it become something totally something else that we've never maybe even thought of? Right. That's a great question. Um, I mean, there are a number of ways I'd like to answer it, but I can't do them all, <laughs> all at once. You can if you like, it's fine. <laughs> okay, right. Well, let's start with the first answer, um, which is um, it follows on from that great question. You know, say we were able to upload or download our memories um, uh, um, you know, in the cloud, then um, is that still consciousness as we know and love it? Um, I would write that question down in a slightly different way, which is, what is the boundary between me and not me? And that boundary would basically delineate the system that is conscious in the sense of the system that is doing the belief updating. So technically, what that is called is a Markov blanket. So a Markov blanket um, inherits from, in fact, uh, um, reflects the work of uh, Judea Pearl, um, but inherits from uh, one of the great probabilistic thinkers, uh, Markov. So a Markov blanket is basically a boundary, a boundary that delimits, enables you to be separated from not you. So your question now is, to what extent can we um, extend the Markov blanket that delimits my belief updating. So I'll now move on to the second way of uh, addressing that lovely question, which is, um, I think you can probably um, move it quite a lot. And we already know that. Um, so, you know, there are, if you like, precursors to things like Neuralink. I'm talking about sensory substitution, for example, or even more simply, Andy Clark's notion of extended cognition and the designed environment or the designer environment. So this is the notion that I can, if I commit to putting all my favorite numbers in my iPhone, I can download my memory into the environment. I can go beyond the kind of memory that I would expect to be encoded by the synaptic efficacy of neurons in my hippocampus. And I can put my memory into a phone. So this notion, um, speaks to the fact that, that we already are witnessing an extension of the dependencies that define a Markov blanket and the extension of me into the world that um, plays the role or is part of this inference process, this belief updating. And remember, I can say this because I've defined consciousness as a process of inference and, and belief updating. Right. If you didn't do that, you would probably have struggled a little bit more to define what you mean by a Markov blanket, but I don't have to worry about that. Um, <laughs> sensory uh, substitution, uh, you know, I uh, um, have a friend, Peter Koenig, who, who equipped people with um, a belt that I think vibrated um, when reorientating your body in relation to the earth magnetic field. So these people now have developed a, a sixth and seventh sense that they were able to now extend their sentience into the magnetic domain wow. simply by equipping the brain with an extra kind of sense organ. And they could learn through this um, process of neuroplasticity, this sort of long-term 
belief updating or data assimilation um, to use this and integrate it into their world model and generate predictions and um, became uh, almost bird-like in their ability to navigate around, I can't remember where it was, like Göttingen, I think, or, or, uh, or Tübingen. Um, so, I, you know, the, 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 these proofs of principle, I think, are already out there. Um, so, I, you know, if you're talking about 50 to 100 years, I can certainly see that that kind of um, extended sensory substitution will transcend the current limits. Um, as long as it, it, your interface with a computer or a virtual world, for example, is in the service of doing this inference or doing this belief updating. Um, and one, you know, in the sense that you, we already interact intensively with our computers, that, you know, to a certain extent, you could argue that at, at certain times, over certain timescales, that our computers and our social media devices are in part an extension of us, they are tools right. um, that are now become an integral part of belief updating. And I, I, I can imagine that, that, you know, one could put neural networks in the cloud that when properly interfaced with, uh, with ourselves, with our own brain, would certainly extend that Markov blanket beyond the bounds of the skull. One qualification here though, um, it's a qualification that is a nod to quite a profound turn at this, uh, the beginning of this uh, century and millennium, which is the, the inactivism term. This is sort of the four E's, extended, embedded, um, um, I always forget the fourth one, so I'm not going to try. Okay. <laughs> the notion that, um, the, 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 you know, our skull-bound brains are embodied and they are situated in a particular context and they have to deal with the tools at hand, which include the way that, you know, we move our bodies and we secrete and we move our eyes um, and also the eco-nation which we find ourselves, which by and large we build generally. You know, if you look around you now, I can guarantee that nearly 99% of the things you see were made by another creature like you. So you are building your own sensorium to make it easier to, to make sense, uh, to make sense of things. That everything around you is in a sense constructed by you either in terms of configuring your computer or you as a, you know, as a, uh, a species, uh, you know, the room that was built by, um, by your builders and your, your, um, your forefathers. Um, then the, the, everything is situated and inactive. So what does that mean for the cloud? Uh, sorry, what does that mean for your brain downloaded into the cloud or your memories or your associations um, it means there has to be a two-way communication uh, that the um the th to 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 sense something is to actively palpate it and to actively solicit that information so I deliberately use the word visual palpation in relation to eye movements before. I'll go even further and I'll say that to see is to look, mm -hmm. that you cannot see anything unless you're actively looking at it, which means that there has to be in the context of a um, 100 years from now, a neural link, there has to be this interrogability, this, this ability to surf and to mine whatever is represented out there in the cloud. There has to, uh, so there has to be a recurrent and reciprocal relationship between you, your brain as an inference organ, an organ of belief updating, a conscious organ, um, and whatever is um, within the bounds of the system doing that inference, which means the message passing has to be recurrent. So you have to be able to touch and feel what is in the cloud and decide what to touch and feel what is in the cloud and at the same time and in parallel what is in the cloud has to get back in an interface and cause neuronal responses in your brain so that that's a very important qualification the technology to do that gracefully is still to a certain extent lacking at the moment at the kind of time scales we're talking in terms of belief updating when we're, we're thinking about 
language and thought and mentation, um, you know, the, the, the finesse and the ability to, to actually decide what information to go and sample on your, from your sensory substitution um, or from your Neuralink, um, that's still slightly outstanding, but that's just a technical problem. So mathematically, right. um, it's possible. yeah, I look for, I won't see it in a hundred years, but hopefully our children will. I, I, I can't wait. I'm actually looking forward to a time if I, if I don't, or, or somebody else does, you know, <laughs> maybe uh, somebody will upload these old videos of mine and keep it into existence as well. <laughs> keep perpetuating it. Um, thank you. The, the other part I want to go into is the concept of, I like the idea that you were saying is like, you know, from our belief, updating our belief system, but seeing really is believing and really interpreting and understanding. So I want to move into the concept of neurodiversity then, because the way that our brains work and the way that our brains are put together and, you know, we, we have different things like ADHD, we have different, you know, concepts of people being on spectrums. Um, when we're looking at neuro neurodiversity, then Obviously, I would imagine the person that has some form of being on any spectrum, because we're all on a spectrum to an ex extent, the way that we see and view reality along with our conscious would be different from all of us individually. So then when we look to the evolution then of, you know, being on the spectrum, are we going to see later on people in the future or even maybe currently within the next five to 10 years, or even could be now that we're going to be grouping together based on the way that we think and how our brain activates. And that could be people working um, in jobs together or coming together in groups based on the way that we view uh, the world through our brain. Yeah, again, another great question, which you know, there are five ways one, <laughs> one can answer that particular one. Um, Apparently, those are my specialty of questions. <laughs> yeah. um, so let me think about the best way to, to, to get into this. Uh, I, I think your, your comment that we're all diverse, we're all on a spectrum, um, is very prescient here. Um, and I would go even further. Um, and I'm going to try and link it to this notion of belief updating that we were talking about in relation to consciousness uh, and sentient, or at least sentient behavior. Um, the way that we think, or I think at least, um, and people in, um, I think in most of cognitive neuroscience, certainly since, since again the, uh, the turn of the century, the way that we think this works is through a process of um, predictive processing. Um, so very briefly, um, and my ambition here is to get in place uh, in, in the conversation, the notion of a generative model that is your brain. Um, and then you'll understand why we are all, you know, a contributor to neurodiversity. Right. Um, <clears throat> so the idea behind um, self-evidencing and or predictive processing um, is very simple. It's just the imperative. It's a normative account. It's a, an account that describes belief updating or conscious, the process of conscious um, consciousness from the point of view of this conversation in terms of optimizing a particular quantity. That quantity is the evidence for my models of the world, also known as Bayesian model evidence. In mathematics and statistics, it's known as marginal likelihood. But if we just focus on evidence, what we're trying to do in terms of making the right inferences understanding what's going on making sense is at every point every aspect of our brain at every time scale is trying to maximize model evidence my evidence the evidence from my model of the world so hence that's um nowadays uh, by certain people known as self-evidencing what does that mean well it just means that i am continually changing the state of my brain at many different time scales to make it a better model of what's going out on out there that's generating all of these um, sensations and that's where the notion of a generative model comes in so um, in the life sciences we would consider the brain to be a generative model a model that can generate the same kinds of sensory input that we actually experience and then the idea is 
that we use these to predict what we would be seeing if we had the right understanding or beliefs about the current states of affairs, these latent or um, hidden states. And the way that we do our belief updating is to update our beliefs to an in a way that minimizes the mismatch or the mistake or the prediction error. Mm. So if we have an organ, there's literally a fantastic organ that can generate fantasies, hypotheses, explanations. For example, you're sitting there listening to me talk. Your predictions, even to the extent of what I'm actually going to say next, are going to be largely spot on. And of course, if you compare your predictions that you are generating with your brain with the sensations that are coming in, there won't be any prediction error and you can gracefully continue um, um, you know, your inference about the way that this sensory stream is going to behave. If, on the other hand, something very surprising happened, then there will be a big prediction error and that would change your beliefs and drive your beliefs in a different direction, right. literally in basic mechanics uh, from your prior to your posterior. So these prediction errors are very, very important in changing your mind, in uh, updating your beliefs from one uh, hypothesis about what's going on to the, to the next hypothesis. To do this, which is just the process of inference, you have to have a generative model, which means that every person has to have or is a generative model of their lived world which means because it's their lived world, if we refer back to this inactivist aspect that we were talking about before, that means every generative model is different because only I explain my lived world, it's not your lived world. So my model is different from your model. If we're all trying to model our own personal worlds and each of our lived worlds is unique, then by definition, we all have different brains and different generative models and do different uh, belief updating, therefore have different uh, consciousnesses. So the remarkable thing though, is that <clears throat> I can talk to you. It's remarkable because clearly my generative model of the world entertains a world that's populated by something, some creature, namely you, that's sufficiently similar that enables me to predict you with great ease. But that's, again, a quite remarkable feat of inference for me to be able to work out that my world is comprised of other things like me, and then to be able to infer or disambiguate whether you cause that or I cause that is indeed a remarkable, uh, a remarkable achievement. And I refer specifically to that ability of human brains to infer that you're another person like me and thereby enable communication and exchange and a mutual belief updating through talking to each other. Um, because I think that has a very particular um, relevance for things like autism. In okay. particular, the notion of theory of mind. You know, so somebody who is beyond the spectrum and somebody who has severe um, autism um, may have difficulties just inferring that in fact they live in a world that is populated by other creatures like, like themselves. So that would have, what would that be like? Well, it would be like um, treating other people, inferring that other people were like fridges or cars or other objects, but not that they were other people of the sort that I could empathize with of the sort that if you did that, then when I do that, I feel this, or I had that intention, therefore I can infer, I can right. leave update that you have those intentions and therefore I can start to empathize and understand, I can predict what you're going to say next, we can turn taking conversation. That all those communicative and possibly affiliative um, aspects would be just missing. So that the particular spectrum in terms of autism, I think is a fascinating, uh, you know, uh, dimension of neurodiversity mm -hmm. that engages me as a psychiatrist because you know there are many overlaps with the kind of false inference you see in schizophrenia but let's right. put that to one side and just speak about the positive things of neurodiversity 
it's positive in the sense that you know, we are so diverse, literally because we, our brains live in different bodies and they palpate the world in a unique way that only you or I can actually do. Um, so why would it be um, good to have neurodiversity? Well, in the same way that a scientist has to have different hypotheses to explain the field of inquiry that they are committed to, it is good to have different generative models. If we, teach, if we treat generative models as hypotheses about this is the way the world works, this is what happens when I do that, you can see immediately having a plurality or a diversity is absolutely essential in terms of finding the right hypothesis or the right space of hypotheses in order to advance and refine collectively our models of the world. So in science, that's you, know, you could write or read neurodiversity as having a repertoire or at least two hypotheses. Usually it's a null hypothesis or the alternate hypothesis. You have to have that diversity else you make no progress. In mm -hmm. evolution, this is just variation. The requisite law of variety, according to um, um, Ross Ashby, the father of uh, cybernetics in, um, in, in the UK. Um, so again, you've got this diversity, which is absolutely uh, essential for this self-evidencing, for this kind of belief updating at the level of conspecifics or um, cohorts or indeed institutions or work groups, that they need to have that, that, that variety uh, to appeal to, to see what works and what doesn't work. And you see this um, everywhere, you know, in a loose way, of course, you know, the, the, the sort of poster child of the people like Vincent van Gogh and various, you know, great composers, they're all slightly mad. They're all quite out there uh, you know, on some uh, spectrum or another, right. but they had a different way of looking at the world, a way that worked for that generation and possibly, you know, um, uh, for subsequent generations, that that speaks, I think, to the essence of, of, of diversity. One qualification which actually brings us um, to your closing comments about being able to talk to and work with people. So yes, you need diversity, but if you become too diverse so that I can't empathize with you, if I can't use my self models, as the basis to make inferences about your intentional stance, your propositions, your beliefs, then we can't communicate. So there's going to be, if you like, a trade-off between having the right degree of diversity that's necessary to generate new hypotheses to improve our understanding collectively as a species or as a community or indeed a family um, of the way that our self-made world works, set against the fact that if we go too far, we can't talk to each other. So there's going to be a really delicate balance getting that, getting that right. And I'm sure that you know, people thinking about how institutions are formed and how groups are made, um, how niche, social niches are constructed, uh, are thinking very, very earnestly about this. And this is a very, not only a very active area of theoretical biology, but is going to be absolutely essential in underwriting the kind of work environment or indeed familial environment that we're going to enjoy over, over the next decade or 100 years. 100%. It will change the way that our world works, our industries work, and how we communicate with each other and, and how we build things and technology. Uh, business, you know, Harvard Business Review was talking a little, a little bit about neuro neurodiversity and how it's important that we do accept it and bring it into the workplace. And I can see that down, you know, if we do this properly and HR changes the way that we view hiring people, you know, we see that sometimes people are hired because they have really high communication skills because they work really well in groups. Uh, but you know, they, they might want to be on the spectrum and they feel that they want to be more independent and they learn and they communicate different ways. So I agree that there has to be this fine tuning, um, within companies that you get the right mix because you get the right creativeness or different types of create, um, ideas, concepts, products that will come out, um, that we probably would never had before because we've stuck to an older model. So I hope that in the future, we, HR looks at neurodiversity even more and it's implemented into our workspace. 
So I'm going to go down a road now uh, of the psychedelic road <laughs> and ask you a little bit about uh, the work that you've done within psychedelics um, and then also your thought between psychedelics and consciousness. So first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the work that you've done in psilocybin and how you started that. Right. So that work um, really reflects um, a longstanding um, training and interest in um, in um, neuropharmacology um, and the friends and colleagues that one made um, coming from that stable. Um, and so a lot of my colleagues, um, certainly in psychiatry, have become fascinated by this class of drugs that has a, an agonist activity, the, the serotonergic receptor, the 5-HT2A. So that's a, a bit of technical um, uh, information there um, that places it within the realm of psychopharmacology mm -hmm. um, and, and a very specific um, um, sort of um, positioning um, that you know a lot of the, a lot of drugs actually share you know this kind of of uh, action. So <clears throat> why is it so interesting? Well, as you know, it can have such profound effects on perception and sentience. And we've just said that consciousness is sense making. Right. Therefore, you know, one could um, easily motivate <clears throat> understanding the role of psychedelics, particularly um, uh, as being essential to understand the mechanics of sentience and this belief updating, particularly in the perceptual domain. Um, it's also very interesting because it targets the transmitter systems, the chemical systems in the brain. So these receptors sit on um, synapses, postsynaptic specializations, which are like little plugs. So it, you know, it's the wiring between one neuron and or brain cell, another brain cell that terminates in a little plug. And the activity, the sensitivity of that little plug is determined by the activity of these um, receptors upon which these drugs, uh, drugs act. Why is that important? Well, it's these neurotransmitter systems that often go awry in lots of psychiatric conditions, particularly um, those um, involved with um, affect and mood, um, but also um, the, affecting the transmitter systems implicated in, uh, in perception and, and organic um, uh, psychosyndromes that have, have hallucinations and hallucinosis as, as, their, uh, as their hallmark. So not only um, you know, is it sort of philosophically interesting to understand sentience and perception, but also it's practically very important because there could be insights here of a pharmacological sort okay. that would speak to remediation or different or um, augmenting, say, talking therapies um, in a way that was motivated by understanding the message passing, the, 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 the physical belief, um, the physical um, substrate of the belief updating during conversation or just during uh, during a trip, for example. <clears throat> so, how does it uh, you know how how does it work in particular? So, the work that we've done, both theoretical work uh, with people um, like um, Robin Kehart um, Harris and um, and Dave Nutt in the UK, and many other people, uh, friends in, in in Zurich and elsewhere. The work, the work that we've done um, suggests that the role of these drugs is actually, in a sense, to disconnect yourself from your prior beliefs. Now, by prior beliefs, what I mean is um, all those things that you've assimilated through experiencing the world and updating your model, your generative model of how the world works, that's kind of the, the, the kind of model I have in mind or most people have in mind uh, now is, is, is called a hierarchical model. That there are the layers upon layers upon layers. If you imagine a big onion, that the, there are layers and layers of abstraction, each layer trying to predict and understand and make sense of the, the next layer out until you actually get to the sensory surface, to this Markov blanket we were talking about before. Right. So um, there's a hierarchical depth to these models. Um, I should also note that that means they are deep models and that resonates with deep learning, which has enjoyed great success 
in artificial intelligence, the deep here is just a statement about the, the hierarchical depth of, of the generative model in question. So the higher you go, the more abstract your beliefs about the causes of your sensations. If you can dissolve the conviction or the precision afforded those beliefs, then you become more sensitive to the sensory impressions and the sensory evidence around you. So it would be a little bit like relaxing, and indeed I'm using words um, that are um, implicit in an acronym for this, it's called the Rebus Hypothesis of um, Robin K. Hart Harris. Um, so the notion here is that these drugs relax our convictions or the precision afforded are deeply held prior beliefs about the way that the world works, enabling us to explore new options, literally um, getting ourselves out of a rut in terms of the way that we experience and sense and sense make uh, the world. So, you know, for somebody who has experienced um, the, 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 the use of psychedelics, then this would be an explanation for why the sensory impressions become so vivid that you can't attend away from the evidence at hand, the immediacy of what's um, of the, the sensorium um, in, in a way that reflects a suppression of your taking it for granted. Oh, yes, I knew it was going to look like that. You know, let's move on and get underneath the, you know, the surface or think about the future. No, you're locked in the moment and you're forced to explain all the sensory evidence in the absence of um, the um, usual prior commitments that your brain would normally bring to the table. So what would that feel like? Well, it would feel, um, it could feel frightening if you had a bad trip, um, yeah, but it could, also, it, it would also um, feel quite liberating um, to the extent it could feel almost spiritual. There will be a disconnect. So your normal, your normal hypotheses entertained by your generative model, which you're, you will take for granted because they're held with such precision, with such conviction, and have been for years and years, such as you are a person and you have a body, um, and that visual sensations are seen as opposed to heard. All of these things, that if I move my arm over here, indeed my arm moves over here, all of these things are hypotheses, they're fantasies that are continually reaffirmed um, to active sampling and confirmation using this sort of prediction error minimization or predictive processing we're talking about, which is one gloss on the self-evidencing. But take away those beliefs, those subpersonal priors. I'm not a person. Moving my hand over here causes it to jump over here. I'm not in my body. I'm somewhere else. I'm not me. I'm not a person. All of these are different hypotheses. So in a sense, we've, we've come back to the diversity argument again. The right. brain is capable of having other hypotheses that, uh, that can only usually be accessed and revealed if we relax the precision or the, or the commitment to one particular one. And that's exactly how people think, or certain people uh, think that psychedelics work. And you can see immediately the putative therapeutic benefit of this kind of um, chemical intervention in, into our perception, our sentience, because it does literally get you out of a rut, a rut being a track worn in the earth, because that's the route most traveled. That's the, the route of the trajectory of belief updating that mm -hmm. I have done time and time again, every lived moment, every day for the past 30, 40, 50, 60 years in my case. <laughs> but that rut is not necessarily the only way that I have to conceive or perceive a thing. There could be other ways of doing it. So that sort of um, enlarging the repertoire of hypotheses to experience the world in different ways could be particularly useful if you caught, got caught in a maladaptive rut. Um, and I'm thinking here of, say, um, terminal care, which, you know, in terms of clinical right. trials has um, um, you know, been the, the most fruitful 
field to demonstrate the therapeutic efficacy of one session with say a psychedelic in a controlled and managed and well-prepared context supplemented by the right kind of counseling um, so put very very simply um, what what could be going on here is that there is a particular way of dying from say cancer and i have prior beliefs about and because we build our own sensorium we build our own cultural but also sensory niches um, in the same sense, we actually build our, you know, we pursue our own narratives. And if I had the narrative that it's awful to die um, and that I should be very depressed and I should be, and everything else that you might associate with a dysfunctional um, response to um, uh, the notion that your, your life is going to end, that's just a hypothesis. That's just what you think a dying person should behave like and you are just fulfilling your um, predictions about this is you know the way that I should behave. There are other hypotheses, there are other ways to do it, but to get to them you have to better jump out of the rut. And to be able to do that, that's where the the notion of um, relaxing your prior beliefs through the use of psychedelics gets into the game as a, you know, a theoretical construct that can explain why there can be a marked improvement in terms of both the affect um, and the you know the coping styles and the cognitive um, the cognitive approaches to adverse situations we've talked about sort of you know terminal care here but you know, one can imagine all sorts of um, psychiatric like uh, or on the road to a psychiatric syndrome that could benefit from this, this kind of revision and I use revision here because again it's simply a revision of beliefs. It's a different kind of belief updating, where now you are revising your prior assumptions, which you may not have sort of conscious access to, but they are there and they are orchestrating through this deep generative model, the way that you sample your world and build your world. Um, and um, if that is not the optimal way, or if there are other better ways of doing it, then you need to have this sort of enlargement of the repertoire of, of hypotheses. But what happens when people, they've had, you know, multiple different types of experiences, you know, we have ayahuasca, we have psilocybin, and we have DMT. Dr. Rick Strassman is, is one of those uh, researchers and doctors that have gone down the road of DMT, um, has written a book called The Spirit Molecule. But in his research, and in multiple other people doing research in psychedelics, they've had similar experiences. And they recall the same thing. Is that because we are humans and we are all very similar and built this and built very similarly that we would have a similar experience or is something actually happening that in the conscious that is creating a different form of reality? Um, I certainly think that it's creating a different form of reality. And I can say that in a very deflation way because of course there is no reality if everything is abductive. So okay. everything's a fantasy. Um, okay. And, um, uh, and that, you know, the, increasing the diversity of the fantasies that you can bring to the table um, in, to exp explain this experience um, is, you know, is, you know, is, is exactly um, um, increasing the range of realities that you can construct to, um, to explain what's going on. So that, that is certainly true. Um, the, 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 the interesting issue, I guess, that you, you're bringing to the table here is that these alternative realities, these alternative hypotheses are shared or shareable. Um, and I think you've answered your question in the way that you posed it. So that suggests that, yes, one can relax one's prior beliefs. I am a person, I'm embodied and, and I behave like this and my body does this and my body does that. Um, one can relax that um, hypothesis and try other hypotheses, but there is a certain stereotype set of hypotheses that human brains will converge upon, which suggests that there is certainly something that is conserved or at least shareable from one brain to another brain. So if we come back to this notion of a generative model, right. is that surprising? Well, no, no, because we, you know, we've, we've just said that generative models are trying to self-evidence, they're just trying to um, fit the world the best they can. The world that we make is made of, of, of other people. Therefore, by definition, 
we are all going to converge on the same kind of brain because we communicate and we work together, we cooperate. Right. And indeed, you could argue that in the absence of conspecifics, in the absence of workmates, in the absence of family, in the absence of um, um, the, any particular species, then you would not be able to do good self-evidencing because nothing would be predictable. The best way to make things predictable is just to hang out with things that are exactly like you. So <laughs> to make the world as predictable as It's not as always possible, fun, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, we come back to this interesting pressure between communication and diversity again. So right. you're absolutely right. <laughs> There's a, another conversation here about sort of um, epistemic foraging and sensation seeking, which uh, which we could pursue, but uh, we, don't, we don't have time for that. Right. Um, <laughs> I wish the, we did. The, yeah, the, 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 you know, the, the denouement of that argument then is the very fact that we have a shared experience of our world, which we share because we all made it together. And perhaps it could be no other way in order to make a predictable world that we all find predictable. Perhaps there are no other universes that could possibly be there would suggest that we're going to have the same set of alternative hypotheses under the influence of, say, DMT, or you know, a strong agonist, you know, um, in terms of the dose-response um, relationship, uh, you know, um, a high dose of 5-H2-2A agonism. It might not be unsurprising that a number of us actually experience the same kind of alternative hypotheses that I that, that would easily be. Um, connoted or easily be um, spoken about as a spiritual experience. And indeed, you know, the, the, the history of use of these drugs is as a, 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 a spiritual tool. I mean, that's where they started. Right. Um, so, you know, to, to, put the, to put the label spiritual or the spirit molecule um, is a very natural thing to do. Um, and you know, the fascinating thing, which I, I, I wasn't so acutely aware of it before your question, but, you know, it, it is fascinating that, that, that we clearly have the same shared alternative hypotheses, shared in the sense we can talk about and understand, um, even though we are different brains and have different consciousnesses. That, that is quite remarkable. Yeah. It is. It's, it's unbelievable. And I will leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for being rebelliously curious with me today. And hopefully we'll have you on again and we can talk a little bit more about consciousness. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you.